One of the highest rate of return on coding time things I do is to create instrumentation that makes debugging easier. For example, we're in the Make PayPal Payout service. I use this to pay people who sell stuff on my website on a monthly basis. And what I want to show you here is this exception. In particular, I want to show you the exception message. Typically, an exception message might have nothing. You might just raise some particular exception and then hope that that is explanatory enough combined with the stack trace, for example. However, in this case, I've created a custom exception message that contains all the information I need to be able to debug this error. I see the email of the person who failed to receive their payment, the current transaction status, which might vary, along with some detailed error description. This enables me to debug much more quickly without having to go through my logs and figure out what happened. Speaking of logs, I also customize what shows within them in order to make debugging much easier. In these two lines here, you can see that I ignore the following controllers, Active Storage Representations Controller and Active Storage Blobs Controller, or rather I ignore the show actions of each of these. This is because I don't want my logs to be overcrowded with information about requests that rarely go wrong. To me, this is just noise. In addition, I append certain pieces of information to my logs. The host, this is because I serve my website on multiple domains and I'd like to know which domain the website was served from when debugging. The current user ID for obvious reasons and the current time. On top of that, I add the exception if there was one. I add the remote IP address. This helps me in addition to the user ID to pinpoint who was affected by some outage. And lastly, I add the form parameters. By default, they aren't added to the logs, but I add them because I want to be able to recover from errors if they happen and not lose any data. Additionally, you can see that my logs have a different format to the default in Rails. Each request corresponds to a single line and within that line, there are keys and values, for example, method equals get or path equals slash revision notes, etc. These are all space separated and this enables me to use other tools that parse the logs for me. I've built myself a tool called events replayer, which takes an IP address and an optional time range and then parses my logs to return a list of URLs that a user has visited and in what particular order and at what timestamp. You can see here that someone looked at the BPTC law civil litigation page and then the taxon BPTC law and then populated an order, went to cart, logged in, etc., etc. Having all this information laid out for me in this very simple, unnoisy way enables me to debug much more quickly. Another trick I use, one that speeds up debugging time, is to insert into the HTML the record ID of whatever the main object on the page is, in this case, a sample document. Let me show you this in action. I search here for something called debugging ID, and now you see a div, and it has an attribute ID with 17594. Now that I think about it, calling this ID is probably a bad idea since CSS also uses ID, but um, it's probably an error in my code somewhere. The, it doesn't make a difference. The big picture is that I can go into my database and search for the sample object with this particular ID instead of having to parse the URL, which has long strings and multiple entries there, rather than parse that and have to find a record that matches these two. Because my software is architected in a way where a lot of the work happens in background queues, I found it useful to add some code to introspect and deal with the job queue. This is my job queue querier. So I've added methods to grab all jobs with errors. This in turn gets used in a method like this one, retry fail jobs. Whenever I fixed a bug, I might call this particular method to run all those jobs right now and see if the supposed fix actually changed anything. Then I have some other methods to find jobs by a particular name or that's related to a record with a particular database ID. This can allow me to match errors within my job queue with errors I'm noticing elsewhere. This next practice is probably only of interest to people running their own online businesses. It relates to understanding your user behavior and understanding how well your various marketing efforts are working. The core idea here is to stitch together the information 
that you find out about a user the first time they arrive on your website, but haven't created an account yet with the eventual user account that they will generate either in that session or perhaps some other time, depending on how you want to do it. So what's going on here is I have this module tracking, which I include in my application controller. So it's available everywhere. And it has a before action store tracking info. Now, what this does is check if there's a session variable called tracking info. And if there isn't, initialize an empty object. At that point, it stores the HTTP referrer. The reason this is done is because I want to remember what website referred a user to me in the first place. If I didn't store this information in the session, like I'm doing here, and instead only figured out the HTTP referrer when a user actually created an account, then the HTTP refer will probably refer to something on my own website since the previous page they were on, which is what HTTP refers to, will have been one hosted on my own domain. That's not extremely helpful. Therefore, I remember the initial referrer here. In addition to that, I remember their initial IP address, what landing page they first arrived on my website, and their user agent. This is to help me debug and so on. Finally, I also store the UTM parameters, things like UTM source, medium, campaign, content. These parameters are only available on the first page where someone lands on my website. And that's assuming I've even set these parameters in the link they were using. But if they're present, they will be remembered and associated with the user eventually. On top of that, I have another thing here that remembers what a given user was interested in by looking at, or rather what someone who is not yet a user is interested in. And then once the user creates an account, I'll know what kind of content they had looked up before they created an account. This enables me to know what to send them in email marketing and so on. Another practice that I believe to be very important for staying productive is to keep the number of major dependencies to an absolute minimum. What I mean by this, for example, is not including too many types of database. I already have a Postgres database by default, and many people in the community like to use a Redis database for their active job queue. I instead opted for delayed job, which is run in SQL. The reason why I did this was because installing Redis adds a lot of overhead. I need to have it running locally. Other people on the team need to be able to get it running locally, including front-end engineers who hate dealing with that kind of stuff. And also, if I had Redis, I'd have to work with that in production and understand it and monitor it. All in all, there are just far more things that can go wrong when there are multiple types of database. I understand completely that Redis is a much better choice for certain types of work. But in the case of my website, Delayed Job does a perfectly good job. A super common thing you'll need when running a website is some ability to alert yourself or whoever is acting in an administrative capacity of your website when something important happens. For example, I might send myself an email or Slack message when an accounting file that takes ages to generate is finally ready so I can pass it to my accountant, or when someone files a refund request that looks suspicious and I want to look into it. I actually don't do that anymore, but that used to be a big deal for me. Now I don't really care about refunds. And lastly, when I need to review a product a seller wishes to put on sale. From my perspective, it would be complete insanity to create separate methods in a mailer for each of these alerting possibilities. For example, an accounting files ready method, refund made method, a seller review needed method, along with separate email templates for each of these methods. This seems like a lot of duplication for something that can be encapsulated in a much more concise form. That form is the following. I have here a generic alert method in my admin mailer. And this takes a message parameter and a subject parameter, and then simply emails it to whatever I've configured my admin email to be. The email template couldn't be any simpler. It's just a paragraph tag with the instance variable of that particular message, which was passed in here. Here we see that functionality in action. I send an alert to myself here via admin email dot alert. I give it the subject, download entire author ready, and um, I let the message just be a blank string. Don't really need it in this case. The subject of the email is enough. And then I tell it to deliver later. This is a one liner to send a nice message. I guess I could even abstract it further and make a top level method alert, but that's a bit too much for me.
Speaking of emails, something that's very useful to have in your development environment is a way to see what emails get sent out and to whom whenever you're manually going through different forms and parts of your website locally. So I'm going to fill out this form here and click send my application form now. And then you'll notice I have a pop-up here that corresponds to an email that just got sent. This email was sent from server at oxbridgenote.co.uk with a reply to jack22 at example.com and a subject gcert law author applied from ASD and a link to manage the particular application. This is very handy for for testing things and doing QA. So how do you get that functionality? It comes via a gem called Letter Opener that was created by Ryan Bates, the guy who made the original Railscasts. And in order to use it, it's incredibly simple. You just go into your development environment and then set the config action mailer delivery method to Letter Opener. That is literally all you need to do. Like many websites, I have some sensitive information behind my administrative area. This includes order details, and also there's the possibility of issuing refunds and so on, i.e. functionality that can have a financial effect. Obviously, I want to protect myself. I don't want some hacker to be inside my admin area and looking at my data or sending money. The first line of defense is, as you'd expect, choosing a good password and ensuring that whoever logs in has to get that password right. But for me, I want to have defense in depth. Therefore, I've also added another layer called Rack Attack. What this does is checks out the parameters used within the login form. And then if it catches someone using the same email more than six times in 60 seconds, it will ban that person for a while, i.e. they'll see this particular response, 429 code, I think that's forbidden, and then a message. The point behind this code here isn't just protection, it's also to prevent DDoS attacks. If some hacker is brute forcing my login endpoint, then the performance of my whole website is going to be pretty bad. So it's better to just ban that sort of behavior altogether. In case you're wondering how this stores state, it defaults to using the rails.cache, which in production will probably be something like memcached or redis. Therefore, it's going to be pretty snappy. Given that this feature relates to security, I think it's quite important to test. Therefore, I've written a throttling spec, which you're looking at here. Essentially, what this does is enable rack attack within the test environment before the tests and then disables it afterwards so as to avoid selenium getting banned when it runs through all the other tests and logs in many many times you need to always do that kind of cleanup and the test takes a limit which i define above as six which is the most times you can log in in a certain amount of time and then it just posts to the login endpoint with some parameters and the user email it doesn't even need to have the password here then I have a variable with the throttle response, what I expect the throttle response to be, which is 429. And I check if the response.status, when I'm just under my limit, is not equal to the throttle response, i.e. the request will work. That doesn't mean log in, it just means not giving 429. And then I post one more time, and I expect to get the throttled response. I'm in my live website right now, looking at a particular order. The email address has been redacted here to protect their privacy, of course. Anyway, imagine that this particular user complains that they were unable to download their digital documents, i.e. what they purchased. If I'm looking at what happened from the perspective of my admin interface here, well, that's not the same as what the user sees when they log in. Therefore, it's important to be able to impersonate your users, i.e. to see the pages as they see them themselves. This way, you can better understand their plight and where they're coming from when they make a bug report. So I'm going to demonstrate that in action now. I have a link here to view the order as the customer sees it. I'm going to click on that. You can see a customer-facing part of the website with the downloads and so on. If that customer had complained that their downloads weren't working, then I could confirm that by clicking them here and seeing what happened. In this case, they do work. But yeah, 
nothing's broken at the moment. While there are gems to do this in a abstract and generalized way, I haven't bothered with that in this code base. And instead, I just have a simple if statement. If the current user is admin, find based on the order number without scoping to the current user. If they're not admin, i.e. in this else branch, scope to the current user and then do the same find. And this code could be more elegant, but you get the idea. Next up, I'm going to demonstrate my absolute worst best practice. This is live code rewriting in the production console. So I've deployed this particular application on Heroku. So I'm going to spin up a dyno and run the Rails console there. While that's waiting to load, I'm going to bring you over to the code here. So I nearly always use this workflow or end up using this workflow when dealing with accounting code. That's because certain types of transactions turn up without me expecting it. For example, a a couple of months ago, I made a payment in Thai Bat or something like that, and the accounting code wasn't able to handle it. I've switched over to the Heroku production console now, and I'm going to build up the Generate Financial Transactions Report model. This uses dependency injection to add a bunch of services there. And then I'm going to call it. Let me check what parameters I want to use. So if we go down to line 29 there and bring it to the top of the screen, it defaults to the start time three months ago, but I'd rather have a start time that's nearer in time so as not to spend too long in calculating this. So I'm going to just choose a start time of five dot days dot ago. And I don't think it needs a second parameter. Okay, so I ran it and I got these three files as output. But I don't quite want three files as output. I want three files emailed to myself. That means I'm going to have to change the code. Yes, technically, I know that I can just loop through this array of files and email them to myself from the console, but I don't want to do that. I'd prefer to test drive the entire new flow in this interactive console. So I'm back in the code, the call method. And you can see an array of sheets is initialized. And then we use the shovel operator to put the result of calling create CSV service into that array. Then we return those sheets. But what we want instead is to call admin mailer, or more specifically to call send account files with those sheets on the admin mailer object and then deliver it. You can see that particular method over here in the right hand. Having done that, the next step is to copy every line of this file into a buffer or the system clipboard in particular. I'm going to do that here. And then I'm going to paste that code into my live console. And you can see that was done just there. You can see a bunch of warnings here about the previous definition, but that's intentional, so you can ignore them. Now I call the method that didn't do what I wanted earlier again to see if it succeeds in sending the emails. And sure enough, it does send those emails. 